Thank you, guys. So as Jeremy said before, my name is Jackson Sanford. I'm the student minister here at the West Fort Worth campus. Uh, any students in the house? I know there's a couple over there. They're real quiet. Yeah, there we go. Okay, make some noise. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, so I just want to say when I found out I was going to do the 1215 service, I did like a little fist bump because I love this service so much. Some of my favorite people are in this service, and um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a disclaimer before I jump into today's teaching. Jeremy mentioned before I'm pretty young. I'm actually 23 years old. Some people say I look more like I'm 17 or 12, but I'm actually 23. I'm into, like, I pay taxes. Um, I have, like, I have my own car insurance that I, my name is on. Like, I promise I'm not um, a student. I'm a student minister. Um, but I know that in a room this size, there's going to be people who have experienced a great deal of difficulty, a great deal of pain. And at 23, I have not experienced the full gamut of uh, pain and difficulty that many adults or, or people who have experienced uh, family members passing away, those kind of situations. And so I'm not offering today a full systematic theology of suffering. What I am offering is where God has taken me on understanding the topic of pain. And so before this teaching, uh, when I was invited uh, to have this honor of sharing on Communicators Weekend, I asked God, I was like, what do you want me to talk about? And I was hoping he was going to give me something super fun to talk about. Uh, but instead, he invited me to talk about pain. And uh, I was writing this teaching, I was kind of concerned because I wanted to share like a funny personal story um, regarding pain, and I didn't have anything. Uh, so we came up on this week, and this past couple days, I took a trip to New Braunfels, and I floated the river with some friends. And as I was in the river, we got to a really shallow part, and I could, like, walk at the bottom of the river. And I thought, this is awesome. I'm going to start walking. And uh, then I stopped walking because I slammed my middle toe into a massive boulder. And so now I have a, a middle toenail that is, like, three shades dark purple, um, it is 45 degrees crooked, and it's kind of goopy. So I'm sorry for sharing that detail. But now every step I take this morning, I'm reminded that pain is real. I'm reminded that pain is real. Who in here remembers learning how to ride a bike? Anybody in here remember learning how to ride a bike? So I was kind of a difficult case learning how to ride a bike um, because I kept like throwing myself off because I was scared I would get hurt. So my parents would try to get me to balance, and I was like, no, like, I can't do this. I'm going to get hurt. The, the fear of pain was real for me. It actually looked kind of something like this video I found. Keep going. Keep going. Push. Walk forward. That's it. <laughs> oh, did you crash? Sometimes the fear of pain just causes us to jump right off the bike. So the reality of life is this, right? Pain is something we all experience. Pain is something we all experience. Whether it's the pain of punting a two-ton rock in a dirty river, um, falling off your bike, being broken up with, feeling isolation, having a family member suffer from addiction, a loved one pass away, a parent aging, everyone knows what it is like to experience pain in some fashion. And here's the second part of that truth. It's really likely that we're all going to experience pain again. And depending on the painful thing we experience, we know the emotions that we attach to the painful things that we go through. We know what rejection feels like. We know what isolation feels like. We know what physical hurt feels like. We know what being disliked, judged, cast out, even hated feels like. We know how we feel about pain. We don't like it. But the question I want to ask today is how does God feel about pain? As followers of Jesus, we're living lives defined by Jesus of Nazareth. And here's what's true about Jesus. Pain is something that Jesus experienced. Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. He never disobeyed God. He lived a perfect and holy life, and yet he experienced pain. 
We are reminded by this by the cross. We look at the cross. It's something that we, you might own some pieces of jewelry that depict the cross. You might have the cross tattooed on your skin. You might see it as something that you hang in your house's decor. But at its heart, the cross is an instrument of pain, torture, and execution. That's what the cross is. And thankfully, we are able to reclaim that symbol as a symbol of salvation and hope. But it can't be the salvation and hope without the pain and torture that define it. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, by his pain, we are healed. Jesus experienced physical pain on the cross. He was whipped, beaten, mocked, scorned. He died a horrendously painful death. The physical pain was not the only kind of pain that Jesus experienced. We read in Luke 19, 41 through 42, um, Jesus is the God of the Jewish people incarnate. He's fully God. He's fully man. And God sends him to his people to teach them, to love them, to care for them, to minister to them, to show them that the kingdom of God is at hand. And they rejected him. So the story picks up as Jesus is walking toward Jerusalem, which is the center of Jewish life. And the story says, as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. I imagine Jesus standing outside of the gates of Jerusalem. And he knows that at the center of Jerusalem, there's a temple. And that temple is built to worship the God of the Jewish people. Their life revolves around the temple. Their life revolves around honoring God. And yet, God is weeping outside of the gates of their city, and they're blinded to it. I can't imagine the isolation and the rejection that the people that Jesus was sent to save, the people that he created and chose as his own, did not want him. Later, towards the end of his ministry, Jesus is aware that he's going to have to die a horrific death on the cross. He spent three years handpicking his disciples. They've lived life with him on the road in Judea. They've seen his miracles. They've seen his power. And he makes one request of them. In Matthew 26, it says, He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He's experiencing existential pain. He's experiencing pain because he knows what's set before him. He knows the pain and the torture of the cross that are going to be coming up. And he asks his disciples, his friends, his community, his followers to keep watch and pray with him. And what do they do? They fall asleep. Leaving him alone to experience the pain of the cross and the pain that is set before him and the isolation of loneliness. Jesus didn't just experience pain for himself. We experience and we have a king who weeps for others. And so where I want to center in uh, our teaching today is in John chapter 11. So you can go ahead and turn there. John chapter 11. I want to set the story for y'all. Um, Jesus's friends, uh, Mary and Martha, have a brother named Lazarus. And Lazarus is one of Jesus's closest friends. Jesus and the disciples are doing ministry away from the town where his friends live in Bethany. And uh, Mary and Martha send messengers to Jesus. And the messengers arrive and they say, hey, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is ill and he's going to die. Mary and Martha know that Jesus has the power to heal people with a single word, a single thought. So they send for him because they say, of course, if Jesus will heal strangers, of course he's going to heal one of his closest friends. Of course he will heal our brother. So Jesus tells the disciples once the messengers arrive, he knows that Jesus is already dead, but he'll resurrect him and heal him from death. He's basically like, don't worry, guys, I got it. Like, I've got it covered. Jesus and the disciples arrive in Bethany. They show up in Lazarus' hometown, and he's actually been dead for four days. So in this culture, um, funerals are not just like three hours on a Saturday afternoon. It's It's a longer extended process of mourning and grieving. And so in that community, uh, they would be, Mary and Martha would be surrounded by their community of mourners. And here we get to see the empathy of Jesus on full display. Chapter picks up in John 11, verses 32 through 36. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus was infinitely wise. We had a teaching a couple months ago where Rick talked about how Jesus was the smartest man to ever live. He was brilliant. As a child, he like schooled the uh, teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees in the temple gates. Um, he was the word through which all of creation is made. He's fully God. And yet, in this moment, he chooses to feel pain and sorrow. And I don't imagine this as a Jesus who shows up and is like logically thinking through this. It's like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to heal Lazarus and don't worry about crying. Don't worry about being upset. No big deal. I'm just going to take care of it. Instead, we see a Jesus who witnesses the grieving of his friends and bursts into tears. That's the Jesus that we follow. He's not questioning his divine mandate over life and death. He's not questioning whether he has the power to heal Lazarus. Jesus is not a child who's trying to work a magic trick and worried if it's going to pull off or not. Jesus knows he has the power to heal Lazarus. And yet, he is moved by the pain of loss, by the pain of mourning. The king of all creation bursted into tears. Pain is something that Jesus experiences with us. With us. We serve, you and I serve, and worship the same Jesus that wept with Lazarus' sisters at his funeral. Jesus wept because he experienced his empathy. His holiness and his perfection is not limited to his wisdom. It's not limited to his thinking. It's not limited to his judgment or his love. It's limited as well to his, it's not limited only in his emotional expression. His emotional expression is righteous. His empathy is righteous. And his grief in this moment is righteous. He weeps alongside people in the face of pain. We serve a Jesus who is human. He eats. Like Bailey said, he takes naps. He gets angry in the face of injustice. And today he sits at the right hand of God, but because of the relationship that you and I are invited to have with him, he weeps when we experience pain. The same way he did when he experienced it with Mary and Martha teenager who feels lonely and isolated, the adult, uh, the parent of an adult who wishes their son or daughter would just come home, the brother or sister of someone struggling with addiction, the single person who struggles with loneliness and isolation and feels like they don't measure up because of their relationship status. Jesus understands how they feel. People who experience long-term health problems that bring great physical pain preventing them from enjoying life the way they once did. Jesus weeps with you. I heard a story uh, a few weeks back as I was preparing for this teaching, and it moved me to tears when I heard it, um, and I thought that I would share it today. Um, there's a couple uh, who had a baby who sadly passed away shortly after he was born. The father, uh, of course, loving his child and wanting to honor his memory, uh, went to make preparations for his son's funeral. So he went to uh, the funeral home, and he went to the cemetery to make arrangements for the burial. And, he's and, he, and he shared how he was sitting across the desk from the representative for the, the funeral home and the cemetery. And the representative like lays down this piece of paper, and it's got all these squares on it. And it's a map of the cemetery, and each square is numbered. Um, and he says, can you point to the one where you want your son to be buried? I'm 23, and I don't have kids. I cannot imagine the grief. I can't imagine the pain of having to boil down my infant son's memory in that moment and point at spot 11 and say, I want my son buried in spot 11. In a task so cold and unfeeling and numeric and say, bury my child who I love in this one. I can't imagine that. Father expressed later in that moment that he asked God, how can a father be forced into this? How can a father experience this? How can I, a person go through something so painful? And he remembered that we serve a God who did just that. In first century AD, God the Father pointed at a hillside in Judea and said, that one, 
in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That's where I want my son to be buried. We serve a God who has experienced grief. We don't just serve a Jesus who weeps with us. We serve a God who provides us hope. Jesus offers, this is my bottom line, and if you don't hear anything else I say, I want you to hear this. Jesus offers unshakable hope in the face of unspeakable pain. God the Father experienced pain at the death of his son. And God the Son experienced pain as he sacrificed himself under the weight of humanity and the world's brokenness to die on the cross. Our God who exists three in one is present in the pain of the crucifixion. Our God suffered that day, and through that suffering, brings us hope for resurrection. And if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you can view the story of Jesus' life and learn practical ways to process pain. I went through a difficult time in my life um, a few years back, and I experienced a lot of pain through that situation, and I was uh, later kind of processing through some of that, and I was sitting in a teaching, and I heard it was a teaching for like student ministers who want to get better at their jobs. I had gone to a conference, and the guy whose name is Darius Daniels, you should definitely go Google him because he's awesome, and he has things to say that are way better than what you're going to hear this afternoon. But he shared that he felt like, and he felt guilty and convicted, that one area the church struggles in is teaching people, especially young people, how to process pain. And in that moment, I didn't just feel convicted because I'm a student minister and I'm responsible for teaching young people how to process pain. I was convicted because I'm the fruit of churches who struggle teaching students and young people and adults, people of all ages, how to process pain. I was never taught how to process pain and difficulty. I was taught to come to church. I was taught to volunteer. I was taught to sing worship songs with a smile and tell everybody at church that I was fine but I was never taught how to genuinely process pain. We can look at the life of Jesus. We can look at scripture. We can see that there's a significant amount of pain in the biblical narrative because there's a significant amount of pain in our broken world. And so we're provided with a a ton of practical ways of dealing with pain. And the first one I want to talk about is that Jesus provides healing through community. I love how in this story, Jesus doesn't like go and hide behind a tree and then cry and then come out. And he's like, I'm Jesus, I'm tough, I don't ever get upset, heals Lazarus, and then go about his day. He's standing there with a bunch of people he doesn't know. And then with his close friends, and he bursts into tears, he weeps with them. He experiences pain in the lens and context of community. And today, he provides us with the same gift. Community is the reason why you're sitting here today to celebrate with your community the goodness of Jesus Christ. So I have a picture of somebody who's very special. Her name is Dora Chazaretta. And shortly after I began working here, Dora passed away. I got to meet Dora my first Sunday here, and I didn't get to know her incredibly well, but I got to hear uh, a ton of stories about her, and I got to hear about the legacy that she left uh, with her friends and family, but in particular with this campus, with the Hills West Fort Worth. Um, Dora suffered from a significant amount of physical pain. She had uh, dealt with illness after illness after illness, and yet one of the great joys of her life beyond Jesus, her Savior, and her loving husband, Steve, um, was serving on the red team here at West Fort Worth with the home team. And when I attended her funeral, when I attended her funeral, I was struck because of how many people um, from our church, from the team that served with her, were there gathering around her family, gathering around her husband, and celebrating and carrying on the legacy of her life. I see a perfect and beautiful picture of how community helps us deal with pain in Dora's story, because I saw a group of people who gathered around her when she was ill, when she experienced physical pain on this earth, and I saw a group of people gather around her family when they mourned and when they experienced emotional pain after her passing as they celebrated the fact that she now gets to spend eternity with Jesus because of her relationship with him. The second thing that Jesus provides us healing through is through prayer. We see in the story that I mentioned earlier when Jesus is preparing to experience his own death on the cross after being tortured 
uh, only after being tortured, beaten, and mocked, he goes to pray. He goes to pray. And his prayer is not, um, it's eloquent because it's Jesus, but it's not um, sunshine, it's not rainbows. He takes his pain to the Father and he pours it out to him. He says, Father, if there's any way, can this cup be taken away from me? And we hear people, and I've heard this before, and I often hear it from students, but I think a lot of adults struggle with this as well. Uh, We hear people pray, uh, people like me who stand on a stage on Sunday and pray almost professionally. Um, We hear people pray around dinner tables and at gatherings, and we hear the words they use, and we think, wow, I could never pray like that. And so we chalk it up that we must not be good at prayer. We're not that kind of person, or that's not a gift or a skill that we have. But prayer is simply a child speaking to their father. When a young child speaks to their father, they don't worry about whether or not their speech is eloquent enough to win his respect or win his approval. They just open their mouths and speak to their father, a father who loves and cares for his child. And Jesus models this for us by going to the father in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. So lastly, Jesus provides us healing through hope. We serve a God who experienced pain. We serve a God who has suffered in the death on the cross, in the loss of a child, in rejection, in isolation. And yet ultimately, the good news of Jesus is that through the resurrection of Christ, Jesus has conquered over death. The kingdom of God has triumphed over the empire of death, of darkness, of sin, and evil. And this gives us hope. Hope in a story already written, in a book already finished. Hope in a king who gives life freely to all who surrender to him. Hope that no matter what happens to us today, death has no victory over us because our victory was claimed the moment Jesus Christ of Nazareth stepped out of Joseph's tomb. Jesus invites us to live each day hopeful. So often, and I'm preaching to myself right now, because so often when I experience hurt, I think if I can just figure out why it happened, if I can just think it just right and figure out all the reasons and make it make sense and rationalize it, it'll go away. I think that that's the magic formula to getting rid of pain. But so often I've lived this again and again and again. I'll try to understand. I'll keep digging for treasure. I'll learn a few lessons. And it's like I'm in a dumpster diving for valuables. And I found a few valuables and I put them in my pocket. But even then I still keep looking. And more often than not, instead of finding treasure amidst the trash, I find myself rolling around in the dumpster. And my invitation and your invitation today from Jesus is to get out of the dumpster. He invites us not to live in the past, and he invites us to not fast forward to the future where everything is ideal. He invites us to take grief one day at a time by practicing life with him. Jesus provides healing through gratitude, and the word gratitude kind of gets a bad rap because it's a pithy word. But gratitude in practice is not pithy. It's a practice, it's a discipline, it's gritty, and it's sometimes a difficult spiritual practice. It allows us to view in one hand the cup of suffering, the difficulties, the pain, the hardship that we all experience, and to look at it and say, yeah, that's real. That's a real thing in my life. And then, in the other hand, to view all of the gifts and the blessings and the goodness of God that's rained down on all of us, and to look at both of them and to admit openly that they are both real. The gospel of Jesus is recognizing that through pain, though pain is real, it is not the king. It has not won. And the way we do this day by day, is by thanking God for the gifts he provides, the way he turns bad things that he didn't cause into a blessing, into something that can strengthen you. A very wise person once told me, some things happen to you, some things happen by you, but everything can happen for you. We experience gratitude for the things that can never be taken away from us. Your salvation can never be taken away from you. The Holy Spirit can never be ripped from you. The promise of a new heaven and a new earth 
led by a perfect and holy and kind and just king can never be taken away from you. If we're willing to surrender to the king. So as we close, I want to invite you to close your eyes. I'm going to read John 16, 33 over you. Before Jesus uh, speaking uh, to, the, to the disciples, this is, this is something that he shares with them at the table. He's seated with them around the table. He knows what's about to happen. He knows that somebody at that table is about to betray him. And he knows that he's going to be handed over to be crucified. And he says to them, words of wisdom that have helped me through pain, have helped so many others for 2,000 years process the difficult things in the world. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Today our prayer team will be all around the room. We're gonna enter into a time of worship And maybe you're sitting in this room, you've heard um, what I've shared today, and you're thinking, I want to be able to go to that king with what I've got in my life. I want to be able to take the pain and the grief and the suffering that I have not dealt with, that either I have run from, that I've shoved down, that I've become numb to, that I've become asleep to. And I want to take that to a just and righteous king and process that with him. I have good news for you. You get the opportunity to do that today. Today. Some pain I know is, is, is physical, and, and I believe um, in medicine. I believe in doctors. I believe that God works through doctors. Some pain is emotional and psychological, and I believe in counseling. I believe in therapy. I think God works through that. So I would never encourage someone to not access those good and holy gifts. But I also think that there's an opportunity um, today for you to practice some of the things we've talked about, to practice community by coming to pray um, with your church family. We're bound together by hope. We are thankful for the good things that God has given us. As the body of Christ, we are a part of a crucified body and a resurrected body. In this, our hope is found. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for, um, I thank you for your son. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the resurrection. I thank you for the way that you chose to come to this earth in a human body, a human body with emotions, a human body that could feel hurt, that could feel pain, both emotional, physical, existential, I pray that as we suffer through these things, as we experience hardship, as we experience difficulty, we would have the ability to come to you openly and honestly about that. That we wouldn't run to vice that would distract us. We wouldn't run away from our pain. We wouldn't run towards false optimism. We wouldn't run to pithy um, quotes or statements, but instead we would run to you. That we would run to the king who has cast death and fear, and pain, and the enemy into hell. We ask all these things in your name.